Metaphor soliloquy. 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 I spark a bleeds and bomb a beat so hard that if any mark ass fraud, I'm see filling the dog and I'm thinking he could bark at me. Nah, they bars as sweet as chocolate beat. Try a hand with another man, not with me. I don't bite, sir. I could get you shot for free. That Johnson and Johnson is not for me. Fuck one time, I'll leave a cop deceased. I solemnly swear that I'm a beat. The best pot lyricist with the conscious thieves. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, beat. A star, call me the contra cheat. Cold down from Petro, I rock with three bros. Hot plus three four, we not the Migos. Hey, root the light, you can call us heroes. Saturday Night Live, no stopping these show. Univisual with super visuals, I keep it a hundred proof. All the new material that I move in, literally boost the symbol of truth. You forget that I don't lose, I win the gold. <laughs> Got sent when I'm in the zone, hella stable, I'm jet with the pillar bro, I hold the sky high and keep the ship afloat, my soul is tied to the times of Bibelos, my vibe is cold and five nine on Babalo, my goal is ball and yam, you know, all of those, I hold the flail for mans that got a problem in the crook, bang for gang gang, tell them the bombinos. I speak in scripture, speech encrypted, read the cryptic mystery, a living premonition, Jesus please, my Jesus peace, don't bring me peace, I need a reason, fill them up with wisdom, Egyptian blood dipped in mud, mix it up, this is just the evolution of us, I lift you up, lift you up. Love to live, this is just a hallucinogen I live to die, die to live Why is it so complicated? You may never get it Duality, reality, don't challenge me I promise he may never ever get it I enter deep the entities They lent to me the energy I gotta give them credit My energy got sent with me Remember me, the heart of David Solomon Is in me double cause I'm on my knees Trouble haunts me in my dreams Slutty about she on her knees She just had to be a team yeah, She my friend and enemy yeah, yeah, she gonna touch the enemy. Yeah, yeah, she gonna be the end of me. The Cabalion is where you want to start at. The Emerald Tablets of Toth is, is more of like, we'll get into why I would consider it more junk food, why I would consider it more fantastical and mystical. And when when you're trying to move along the path of initiation and you're you're trying to understand all these different systems, right? You're trying to evolve your soul. You're trying to whatever you want to call it. What you need is a system in place. What you need is something you can grab a hold of and not a fairy tale. And that's why the Kabbalion is so important. That's why the Kabbalion has so much weight because it's breaking down each principle that you can then apply to other hermetic texts. So we're going to get into why this is the case, obviously, but I just wanted to kind of lay out the foundation as to you know, good or bad, if you've only got a few minutes to watch, I wouldn't don't spend a lot of time on that unless you are learned with the with the Kabbalion, unless you have the principles and you can ramble them all off and you know how to apply them to every different situation and scenario, spend your time there, spend your time on the Kabbalion. And then you can start to look at things like the Emerald Tablets. They just have a cool name, right? They've got a cool name. And it's like a you know, oh, it's like it's this you're a part of this club because you know about the, the Emerald Tablets of Toth. And and there is a lot of deep stuff in there. There's a lot of there. You just got to get to it. Right. You've got to be able to get through the mythos and not just look at words like infinite and light. And do you know what it means when they say 32? Do you know what it see the numerology? Right. You need to understand these other things that you're not going to get that from that text. So. Read the Kabbalion, study the Kabbalion, let that be your main focus, and then move on to something like these tablets. But now that we're talking about these tablets, I don't know where you want to you wanna go with a bit of the history or... I guess, Vitaly, do you have anything to add to that kind of intro? I would, I would say, yeah, that's a, that's a, 
That's a, a very important aspect and one thing to not. The one thing that we should keep in mind is that entering any kind of spirituality, what's very necessary is, is to be able to break your, your current uh, state of understanding. You have to shatter it. You have to be able to go past, above and beyond what you think you know. So I would agree with what you're saying, but I also um, would say to study everything, study everything that you that you can get your hands on. Depending on how deep your desire is, that's really what the key is. How if you've got a strong desire to enter everything and learn everything as much, beautiful, perfect, use it. If, if that's what's calling you it is the Kabbalion and, and, and to learn, you know, certain kind of systematic approaches to, to things, absolutely it's necessary. We can't forget that there's two pillars at play here. There's two hemispheres that, that, are, that are always moving with each other. And as long as they're moving together, it's important, right? Because to learn a systematic approach without having the right pillar is, is like reinforcing your intellect, right? Which really we need to be able to get past that. So, so to also be able to fuel your sense of awe and fuel your sense of, of something greater than yourself and to be able to reach into something further than, than what you currently, currently know. And, and I think that's, that's one of the biggest, uh, the biggest that I make regarding what was just said is, is to, is to use that, use what you can, as long as you're moving into the unknown, that's what's really, what's really uh, important, right? Because you want to shatter your state of what you think, you know, because the person who has never entered spirituality and wants to, and wants to enter through the Kabbalion and start learning these hermetic principles, they're, they're applying it to what they currently know. Right. So it, it's, it's kind of almost in a sense, self-defeating if you're not feeding the right pillar, then there's a saying in Kabbalah that the right pillar has to lead. The right pillar has to lead because the right pillar is what's breaking you out from your current form, right? Mm. And, then, and then so if you're constantly leading with the right, this is the correct form. And, yeah. And, build, and building on the left as you go because you're always moving. You're not supposed to stay still. You're supposed to be constantly expanding. But when you enter it, absolutely. I think for some people, it might be necessary to go with the right approach. Some people with the left, some people more, you know, uh, um, kind of. Uh, like you said, it's balance. Just real quick, yeah. Jordan. And I, I agree 100%. So I guess for me, I should come out and say, usually in the mystical community and people that are interested in these types of topics, usually, right, I'm stereotyping, they lean into the right and they don't lean into the left. Right. So I, I should right. preface with that. I agree 100%. It's about balance. And if you've been leaning into the left, you've been leaning into the principles, you've been leaning into academia, or you're going to, you know, maybe not yet, but you know, hey, after I read this book, that's where I'm going next. Then, yeah, I agree 100 percent, Jordan. Mm. Well, yeah, I agree, too. But it, it, I understand exactly why both of these approaches are equally necessary when you combine them, because, you know, me and you, Vitaly, we talked about the systems and how they're orchestrated and how the worlds came into existence. And when you're thinking about Hakma and wisdom and you correspond it to the right hemisphere and how the right and think about how the right hemisphere works and when you process information from a novel standpoint that that's the first place that the information is digested it's the insights that come through the right hemisphere which have a holistic approach your right hemisphere is contextual so it keeps things within the context of the whole and it has a non-linear approach it has an abstract approach and it allows for you to have uh, a natural uh, conception of how everything works together and it flows coherently. But then the left hemisphere is Bina, which is understanding, and it assimilates that data and it breaks it down and it creates patterns and molds and blueprints. And um, it's the fabric of existence. And that's literally how you reach out and you make these ideas tangible. So we lead with the right, you know, literally from a cerebral standpoint. Our brains lead with the right and then it uh, follows with the left because the left is what allows for us to break it down. And, you know, it's part of survival in the physical realm. If we didn't have the capacity to concentrate it, then it would just be one homogenous thing 
And then we wouldn't be able to differentiate and to distinguish between things and we wouldn't be able to have discernment. So, you know, even when I was watching a lecture on uh, Kabbalah earlier about um, Bina, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Bain was one of the words that they use within Bina and it meant like an intermediary. So it understands by way or it understands as an intermediary. It, it needs wisdom for it to concentrate everything in a more solidified manner. So when when we talk about leading with the right and then following with the left, it's not like one is greater than the other. It's just that it's the, it's like dancing. If there was a proper way of dancing or boxing or you know like you lead with one foot over the other, when we say right, it's not it's not necessarily right over left or left over right. It's more about how the universe functions. You know, you don't start with a particle. You start with the field. So, it, 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 you know what I mean? Like the, the universe is structured in a very specific way. And because of that structure, it has a very definite form of functionality. And the brain is a replica of this process. It's a it's a microcosm. It's a fractalized pattern of how this these structures and these processes work. So I would agree. Um, and you can elaborate even more, uh, Vitaly, but, you know, from a physical standpoint, we can literally see how, you know, how our biology is a replica of this process. Right. Absolutely. Because you're going from uh, you're going from a limitless form to a limited form and only in the in, in the limited appearance. This is what we're locked in. Right. And so, of course, it's the right that is drawing people in because we're looking for some answers to to this left pillar existence that we're in, right? So you have to apply the right because that is where the infinite is, right? The left is always where the limits are. And, and so to, to lead with the right is always, and of course, you have to grow both together, right? There is no progress of being without a progress of knowledge, right? Knowledge has to come with your being. If you learn something and you're not applying it, well, then what have you really learned, right? So knowledge and being always have to grow together. And that, again, is your left and right pillar. But uh, eventually you do come to a point where you have to, you truly do lead with the right because you realize that that is where all of the answers are, right? And you're understanding it through the left. But you're but you're giving the you're giving the leverage over to the right. You're giving the leverage over to the infinite, right? You're giving it to the all where where it's supposed to be, and only keeping the left as the instrument of understanding, which is what it's supposed to be. Mm, yeah, each each uh, left and right both have their parts to play. Yeah. Don't sure. try to force the right to break things down. Don't no, try to yeah. force the left yeah, to build things up. Yeah, you can't force nothing. Everything is truly natural and organic. That's uh, that's how you run into problems is when you're trying to force things. Where, yeah. So we're saying all this just to, and and Vitaly, thank you for for kind of you know uh, questioning me on on how I stated that that intro. So I appreciate that. That's not so, about questioning. I'm just I'm just uh, I'm just uh, adding adding to. It. Sure. Thanks for adding that color. Yeah, I appreciate that. Because you know some people are right very right and they need the left right that is what they're missing right? and some people are coming at it from the left right we have two different walks of people who have studied spirituality and are not scientific at all and it's very yeah. you know pseudo spirituality new age spirituality they have no way of making it actually practical and marrying the two sides right so yep but if you so, consider all of the ancient if you consider the ancient writings if you consider the ancient writings the writings were written in a way where they would not go out and flat Flat out tell you what they're talking about, right? It was meant to be a mystery. It was meant to to have some kind of effort to put into it to crack the code. Yeah, it's like flexing that muscle. I agree. I think when I went through and read it, it was more of I'm using my systems, right? Because I've accumulated different systems in different places, which by that I just mean different religions, different philosophies, whatever you want to call it. You flex that muscle when you're reading mythos. And by doing that, that's, that's the breaking it. That's right. That's the breaking it down. That's the building it back up. So it's important to, to use both, I guess. Right. And that's what we promote. We promote the whole holistic thinking Absolutely. and with the, you know, with, so with these Emerald Emerald tablets, there was some, um, 
history that you kind of wanted to, mm. to talk about, right? Well, yeah, I wanted to clarify that, like, when we talk about the, you know, when I say we, I just mean like the general, you know, like people that are investigating this and they're not doing so from a scholarly standpoint or they're doing it purely from a scholarly standpoint. You can't approach it predominantly from either arena. And, you know, but when we do approach it from a scholarly standpoint, we're going to omit, omit a lot of the uh, symbolism and the mythos. And we're just going to look at it purely from an intellectual standpoint. And there are some valid points that we're going to come to um, when we approach it from purely an intellectual and a scholarly standpoint. We're going to realize that, you know, when we talk about it being ancient, we're not talking about it being ancient, you know, from the right hemispheric standpoint, when we talk about it being ancient, they like to think that there's some scholarly evidence and a continuation of writers from the most primitive times. Like, you know, you imagine some uh, long beard guy in a torn robe walking on water from sunken Atlantis. Yeah. And you imagine he's carrying these tablets throughout the ages and he's immortal. And, you know, he's Hermes, he's Toth, he's whoever. And then the scholars will say, well, that's not the case because the tablets, the emerald tablets that we're familiar with, we don't really have any scholarly evidence that they uh, are, you know, have any B.C. accounts or even early A.D. accounts aside from like, you know, like the ninth century, if I'm not mistaken. There are like three tablets that are Arabic based uh, in that time frame. So they say that there is no evidence of it being, you know, Grecian or Hellenistic or some of these other languages that they say it might have been derived from. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't have ancient origins from a, you know, symbolic standpoint. Right. You know, meaning that this wisdom has been carried from ancient times, from the mouth to the ear of the master to the student and so forth. This wisdom has been carried on and you've had and we have seen it in a multitude of other ways. And it may not be specifically articulated in the same way that it is in the Emerald Tablets as we know it from a scholarly standpoint. But the wisdom is still inherent within the symbolism and the mythos. So you know, I want people to understand that when you're delving into this, just like we talk, you know, lead with the right and then follow with the left, you want to have these insights. You want to, you know, uh, crave and have a desire for the mythos and desire to know what the mythos is. But then you also have to approach it intellectually and you have to break it down and you have to have discernment because if you if you primarily focus on it from the standpoint of the intellect, from the left hemispheric approach, you're only going to get a scholarly viewpoint and you're going to miss out on a lot of the jewels and a lot of the symbolism and the, 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 um, the wisdom hidden within the mythos. But then if you primarily focus on it from a right hemispheric standpoint, then you're, you're going to miss out on a lot of the history when it comes to, um, you know, the left hemispheric approach. And there are a lot of jewels within that too, because you don't want to just fabricate your own history. A lot of times metaphysicians won't be taken seriously because they will just make up their own history. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. You know, it's the same way in the metaphysical community versus the scientific community. A lot of scientists are not messing with metaphysicians because they are just slapping scientific labels onto metaphysical concepts, not actually knowing whether or not it's valid. And it's not to say that it's not valid in one way or another, but you can't just do that. We have to find a meeting place. We have to meet in the middle the same way your right hemisphere and your left hemisphere meet in the middle by way of the corpus callosum. So, you know, equal in nature, different in degree. We have to unify these two to really have a truly profound and coherent comprehension of these texts. Yeah, if you're going to claim these texts, right, that Toth was an Atlantean, and you're just going to claim that outright, people are going to want to see, okay, how, like, oh, did the text go back to when we thought yes. Atlantis was a thing? Like, are, are we able to trace it that far back? Is that why? And people get excited because mm -hmm. they think that what they're reading is in, uh, you know, a language that was, uh, you know, it was, it was transcribed or it was translated from whatever language. I don't even know what language they say Atlantean spoke, but <laughs> when... It, it turns out, no, that, you know, the tablets that we found are uh, mostly Aramaic It's Arabic. or Arabic. Mm -hmm. Then it's it's a bit of a, OK, well, it does, like Jordan said, it doesn't mean there isn't truth in the symbolism. It doesn't mean that there that, that, you know, this story could be have been orally passed down. But then why did they decide to to just put it on those tablets? It's it just there's, there starts to become that reasonable doubt. 
And that's what we all need to be looking out for when we use the principles, when we're listening to spirituality, when we're, you know, moving through life. That's what we're trying to teach you is when, when that's, when that, when, when you start to get that reasonable doubt, when that reasonable doubt starts to creep in your mind and you can't blast it away with facts, you can't blast it away with, um, the principles, then I would start to, you know, you kind of, it kind of helps you know what to read, what not to read. And that's kind of what we're here to kind of help break down. Not that you shouldn't read it. You know, I think that if a, if a text or something is recommended by someone that you trust, go ahead and, and read it. But like, I'm going to keep on harping on this. To me, the principles should be in everybody's back pocket. And I, I, you can't, I don't think that my mind would ever change with that, with that approach. But Vitality, what do you think about the authentication of the, of the history of these tablets? Have you had any chance to look into that? Honestly, that's not something that I, I spent too much time on looking sure. at history or the scholarly approach to it. To me, it was always the wisdom that's in it, uh, in any scripture. That's really what I'm aiming for. I don't think that it's um, it's something that we should spend too much. I mean, I, I mean, again, it, it depends on the person. Are, are you a scholar? Are you, you know, are you a sage? Are you entering the spirituality for, you know, for uh, uh, uh paper that you're writing in, in university or something like that. It depends on your intention. What is your intention, right? I mean, I think the wisdom is what we should really be paying attention to. And even the even that the name of it, the Emerald Tablets of, of Thoth or Jehudi, uh, which would be his actual Egyptian name, is is to apply the archetypes of what are we talking about? What is Emerald? What, why do they call it Emerald? Who is Thoth? What does he represent? And how? What is the ultimate truth here, which is more important than the than the historical truth, right? Yes, it's yeah, sure. Can you still get to that historic? Can you still get to that ultimate truth? Sure, but I think having the historical validation is just something that allows someone to stand strong on what they're reading. Sure. That's 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 my point. Well, yeah, because the left is always going to want to discredit the right when it doesn't have anything to latch on to. Exactly. Especially when the thing that it's supposed to latch on to doesn't have any validity from a historical standpoint. So I agree with you, but I also would say, hey, we, we should do we should do the necessary research in both realms because it's just as important to know the history um, for the sake of teaching it to other people, because you have so many people that are approaching it from a left hemispheric standpoint who will just reject it because they're like, well, I don't really see that how there can be any validity in it if there's no historical accuracy. And it's like, well, that's not the case. You don't need historical accuracy for there to be validity, right. but you need to be able right. to explain that as well. I can't just approach someone and say, hey, there's no historical validity to this, but you don't need any of that. I know you're the left hemisphere and I'm talking to you right hemispherically, but you don't need any of that validity. And it's like, you know, that's why I enjoy doing research um, from both approaches. I love researching metaphysics and then I love finding physics that can validate it and or invalidate it because when stuff is invalidated, I'm equally joyed because I'm like, OK, now I know, you know what I mean? Like this concept right here doesn't necessarily apply. And sometimes science will invalidate spiritual concepts and that doesn't necessarily apply spiritually. They may be invalidating something that is valid, but they're not aware of it. But my brain, I've. I've developed in a specific way where I can make those distinctions for myself because I'm leading with the right and I'm following with the left and I'm in step with this process. And that's the whole point is creating that equilibrium so that we can always walk in step. And I think another valid point to make before I let you, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, go in Vitaly is when we're, the reason why we follow we, we we lead with the right and follow with the left is because you don't want to be attached. Like right is expansion. So it's not about attachment. It's about allowing yourself to exist in the moment and to and to allow allow yourself to be inspired and be in awe of the divine. But right. then once you receive that 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 download, now you have to process it. And then you have to realize that no matter how sophisticated or the lack of sophistication in this intellectual process, none of it is absolutely accurate. 
because the right hemisphere is more about uh, taking things out of the context of the whole and labeling it for the sake of conceptualizing it and using it practically. So I know that might sound impractical, but that's essentially how we work as organisms. We process things right hemispherically and then we we assimilate it and digest it and we excrete it via the left hemisphere. That's how we make it practical. But no matter how practical it is, it's never an absolute. So you can't attach to it uh, in one way or another. You see what I'm saying? But you have to be connected. So the right hemisphere is detachment. The left hemisphere is attachment or connectivity. So it's we, we need both of these equally and in a state of equilibrium. And it's never a perfect equilibrium. It's always oscillating between the two. Yeah. So let's uh, I mean, we're 30 minutes in that th- we just wanted to give a, a thorough explanation and some some kind of ideology behind what we feel about this text and the way our the way we think about it and the way we think about what we read and and when we read it right it's more than just hey it's talking about aliens man it's talking about sea people you know there's a lot more i'm not gonna (laughs) you rub it right so (laughs) that's what i'm trying to you know that's over here you're not going to get that so you know if you if you're for sticking around i know that you guys are actually here to learn you actually want to know how to move along how to really digest information so let's Let's just jump in now, though. I know we're so we couldn't talk about the whole book. Um, uh, that I just got the banners up, but uh, we couldn't talk about the whole book. But I I know we're gonna we got we've got a few topics we're gonna talk about. I've got a few quotes that we can talk about and how to break them down. But I just kind of wanted to ask you, Vitaly, do you think that the this is a uh, the Emerald Tablets of Toth is a uh, Kabbalistic? That depends on, okay. The true nature of Kabbalah will incorporate all wisdom texts. So it, whether you're talking science and science papers by physicists and, and, uh, and you know, quantum theories, all of it is Kabbalah. It is all Kabbalah because Kabbalah, the truth of it, is, is, the, is, is the wisdom science. So it is a science to understand the nature and the reality of everything. And it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, mysticism. It's truly a science. It's a real science. So yes, I would incorporate everything under that umbrella <laughs> based on, based on the true definition of the term. Yes. So what do you think about some specific things within the Emerald tablets? Like when they talk about the halls of a minty, Could you break that down and elaborate on that and maybe talk about the throne room and so forth? That's that's a lot to bring in and and to try to squeeze into. But these are two that have been spoken about in many different writings. You have Theosophy who writes about the halls of learning, but truly it's all based in in the Egyptian spiritual systems, which majority of of everything that we, we are discussing it comes from, which is a remnant of the oldest civilization. So these are eternal uh, wisdom. So when they're talking about the halls of Amenti, if you read, they're talking about the the uh, those who are dead and those who are alive. So you're talking about the two currents that exist between this realm of a physical existence and the root source of all things. So it is the in-between. These are called the halls of Amenti. And if you take the word Amenti, uh, you have Amen, who is who is uh, who is the creator in the Egyptian mythology. Well, one of them. There's multiple depending on which city that you that you uh, are from. And then they added the uh, and uh, um, or Amenti Ta Tet. That was also that was always uh, indicative in the Middle Nature, which is the Egyptian writing system of a place. So they would say Amen T meaning the land of Amen, which mm. is the land of, of, of the creator, basically. It was always the underworld, right? Representing that which exists outside of this realm of existence. So that, so, so to you, the halls of Amenti is a place physically, it's a place spiritually. I just want to get your take on what is that? 
Yeah, it is absolutely physically. Now, when we say physical, we, we like to limit ourselves to this, this reality that we know of. But every single degree of emanation is a physical reality. If there's yeah. a form there, if there's any kind of movement, there's physicality there. There's a re, there's something there. There's a something, right? So, and there are degrees of it. So the higher that you go, the less of a thing it is, but it's still a reality when you're embodying, you know, a force body or a... Uh, uh, sure. You so, know, right? you know... Um, when we're talking about, you know, when he was having this vision, for example, in the halls of Amenti, they were burrowed out or chiseled within the core of the earth. And when I was listening to it, you know, on Audible, I'm thinking, and I had read it years ago, but, you know, I've studied more recently, you know, Kabbalah, Kabbalistic texts, and I'm thinking of Malhut, and I'm thinking of Geb, and I'm like, okay, we know that Malhut is all of existence. Everything expands from uh, Malhut of infinity. Um, so kingdom, uh, yeah, right. and which represents kingdom. So I was thinking when he was talking about the halls of a minty and hollowing out the earth and building these different chambers of the dead and the living and so forth. Uh, they were talking about the fronts and the backs of the, uh, the spheres, the sephira, as well as the right and the left pillar. So maybe you could elaborate on that as well. I actually just cut, cut out for uh, for about uh, 10 seconds. So if, if you can recap a little bit of the question, I know you're talking about the carving out of the inner earth. Yes. And the fact that that sounds like it's relating, if it's a Kabbalistic text in theory, it sounds like it's relating to Malhut and the kingdom. Um, Cause that's what Malhut means for those of you listening. Malhut in Hebrew is kingdom and Malhut represents um, it's, it's symbolic to the world of Asiya. Asiya. So the expansion of Malhu creates the expansion of all of creation. And me and you were talking about this earlier. And I was thinking that if he hollowed out uh, the halls of Amenti within the core of the earth, then most, and it's, 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 it's a comedic system. They're most likely referring to Geb. Geb is the Egyptian equivalent of Malhu. So do you think that that's what they're referring to? And then maybe elaborate on the, um, the halls of the dead and the halls of the living. Um, I'm not sure if they were directly relating it to uh, any particular uh, Egyptian deity, even though that you could apply those, those, uh, those characteristics and those personas correctly, if you know uh, who and what they represent. But uh, as far as Kabbalah goes, the entire creation is an engraving and a hollowing out of the light which is called the Tsimtsum. And so if, if you're considering the, the ancients, the earth was always representative of the center of the universe, meaning creation itself, right? So if you're applying that these, uh, when you're talking about the insides, these are the higher hidden le le levels and layers of the reality and talking about that it was carved out for a place for these great beings to, 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 to sit on their thrones and watch over the sons of man. What they're talking about is a completely a Kabbalistic concept, which is written, I mean, thousands, thousands of years. If you read the Zohar, it's all there. It, they, the, the process of the Tzimtzum is a hollowing out of the light, which was a restriction of the light for a place for creation to exist, right? And clearly the first emanations from that are the highest ones. And then it's a cascade down all the way into this world. Right. Yeah. And, and that's that's literally how they describe it. So, like I said, yeah. when I was reading it, that was kind of the conclusion I was coming to, because it sounds exactly like the concept of Simsum, especially if uh, Malhut of Ain Sof or Malhut of Infinity is where creation begins. And a lot of people could misinterpret that and think that they actually hollowed out a cavern physically in the planet Earth. Right. You see, and that's right. another problem with the literal interpretation versus the symbolic interpretation and conceptualizing it via the mythos, but then breaking it down intellectually. And right. another thing I would like to discuss is how after uh, the halls of Amenti were hollowed out, they then created the sons of light, created 32, 30 and two. So 32 thrones 
for them to sit upon. And maybe you could elaborate on that because that also sounds like it directly relates to what transpired after the seam soon. Uh, you're asking some heavy questions. These, uh, <laughs> the, the, now again, you have to be versed in um, the meaning of the numbers. What do they mean, right? Because we can apply 32 so many ways to, to one person, oh, it's just a number, it means nothing. But truly, it's, it's a very, very deep meaning. For example, if you take the original Torah, which is the Old Testament of the Bible, the first letter and the last letter, which encompasses the entire Torah, which Torah, to understand, is, is, it means the laws of light. So it's not, so just, again, I know you guys are very adamant about creating a language. So it's, I agree that it's extremely important and that should be a foundation because with that understanding of the language, we look beyond what the word is wrapped in and look towards the essence. What are we actually talking about, right? So when I say Torah, it means laws of light. It doesn't mean it's just for Jews, okay? And then you have to get into the conversation of what is a Jew? What does a Jew truly mean, right? Because a, a Buddhist could be a Jew based on the essence of the word. So could a Christian, so could a, a Muslim, right? So based on that, the first letter and the last letter is 32. So 32 encompasses the entire Torah, which is the laws of the light, all right. And uh, you can go deeper into what the, the 32 actually means. And that could be a whole other uh, uh, talk. Right. That could take hours and truly lifetimes to to uh, to understand it. But um, as an architect, 32, what does it mean? Yeah. And I appreciate you. And this is why it's so important to the listeners. This is why it's so important. I'm just going to keep harping on this because what I, what we really want to do is have a community of people who th who are thinking about these types of concepts and they're breaking it down who are able to consume information because they have some way to consume it just like they were just talking about you know the hollowing out of the earth and if you don't have anything to bring that back to then you're really going to think that these people are living in the middle of the earth Right. And, and a lot of people probably do when you read yeah. things like this, you've got to know when it's being symbolic and know when it's when somebody's being logical. And I know I lean much more towards the left, the left hemisphere. But I also, you know, I love reading. I love reading about mythos, but I know what mythos is and I know how to wrap my head around mythos and bring it back to my system and start to break it down into the components in which they belong. So it's easier for me because that was a huge problem for me before I started realizing that I didn't want to be a Christian. I didn't want to be a Muslim. I didn't want to be a Buddhist. I didn't want to be this. I didn't want to be that. But I saw value in all of them. So I started to realize that I needed to use all the systems. I'm going to use all these systems to my advantage. And they don't, they don't really, they only start to contradict each other when you start to get down into certain like ritualistic and the essence of these different practices do not contradict each other. So I just started picking up on, on different systems. And then once I had those systems and I understood those systems, I was able to look at mythos or stories and Oh, that's what that now, instead of it just saying something about a number right now, I, Oh, okay. In this, in, in this system, that number means this, right. Or in this system, can I, can I find a place for that number? Can I find a place for that idea? What about now I take it to physics? Cause to me, academia is a whole nother system and there's subsystems inside of academia. You've got physics, you've got biology, you've got chemistry, you've got psychology and psychology and physics, I think, are two of the main subjects that are usually in these mythos. The psychology is, you know, it's littered throughout these texts of how a man might think, how Hermes or Toth thought or, you know, it, it, you can't help but incorporate psychology just like you can't help but incorporate physics in, into the mythos because that's just embedded in, in essentially everything that we everything that we do and everything that we talk about. So. Again, you know, to, to break down this particular book, and I'm glad that this was shout out to Jay Smoke for bringing it to, to our attention multiple times. Mm. It would take, if you really wanted to go through the tablets, it would take quite some time. I do have some quotes, though, from some of the different tablets that if you guys are down, we can pull them up and just kind of, you know, talk about what we think about these quotes. Mm. So I've got, here's a, 
And I don't know, Vitaly, can you see uh, what I'm putting on the screen? Can you see? Yeah, okay. So knowledge is considered the highest form of power. That is in the 10th tablet. So since I'm, I guess since I'm already kind of talking, uh, this is basically what I just said. Now, because knowledge is considered the highest form of power, it's not just the left brain, like Vitaly said, it's not just the right brain, right? We're not just using certain hemispheres or certain characteristics of certain hemispheres to get through life. True knowledge and understanding is, uh, is holistic thinking. And that's where the power comes in when you have that cascading effect from, you know, uh, consuming a system with the right hemisphere, breaking it down and, and kind of pushing it through your, your body, through your system with the left hemisphere. That's the, to me, you know, the true, uh, high, the highest form of, of power. Well, yeah. Embodiment. When I think about when they, when he says this, you know, cause once again, I don't know who said it, but when I think about it in my own personal way, I think of knowledge as raw data and data, raw data as in beyond perception. So you have what they call the light, the surrounding light, which would be raw data. And then our vessel would be processing that raw data. And then that's when it becomes um, tinted, you know, through the mechanism of perception and then embodying that, you know, embodying that and reaching what they call in um, Kabbalah equivalence of form. Davekut, reaching equivalence of form with that raw data, you know, as best as possible by equalizing oneself with the nature of that data, with the nature of that knowledge. So you, you're translating it, you know, to the best of your ability and you're optimizing your capacity to relate to nature. So true, true power of knowledge is in the embodiment or the digestion of the raw data from nature and emulating that process. So that's what I think about when when um, when I when I see that statement. Yeah, that's true. And I can uh, this. Is, I mean, there's layers of this. Right. If we're applying it to this level, what's the highest level of what that means? The highest level of what that means is exactly what you said in terms of equivalence of form, because true knowledge is not intellectual. True knowledge is an experience. And what the Kabbalists, the sages would say, you cannot name what you do not attain. Mm -hmm. That means is you cannot speak about something that you have not entered. So these are levels of reality. And what happens is when, when you actually achieve real knowledge to the highest level of what knowledge means, that true archetype of knowledge is you're equalizing with this, what we call light. Now, when you equalize with this light, you share in its powers. That means that you have achieved this. This is actually a very true statement. You are sharing in the power of the creator, which is the goal of the entire system, is to enter into higher and higher degrees of the creator so you become a co-creator to its truest essence. You are actually enter into these stages where you do share power over all the lesser beings under you at that point. Perfect. Uh, I got another one here. This is a great one. Three is the mystery come from the great one here and light on the will down. Is it? No, light on these will. Okay. Will dawn. So, I think that a lot of people could probably relate to this because we see threes in multiple systems. And that's why I think it's important to, to, to be a, a scholar of different systems and a short, yeah, experience obviously is important, but to understand, okay, when I see three, my mind, it'll go to, I've, I've been reading Kabbalistic texts, so it can go to uh, the Kabbalah or it can go to Christianity, right? Or it can go to uh, Hinduism. So it can, you know, it can go to all these different systems and the, the mystery. So I think Vitaly and, and Jordan might have a, you know, a little bit more to say on, on this from the, from the Kabbalistic sense. But let me hit it just from, from Christianity. Obviously, we know that, you know, you've got the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You have these three aspects of a divine um, entity that exists as one. And, and the light has, you know, the light is symbolic to, I mean, it's symbolic to a few things. It's symbolic to truth. It's, it's symbolic to, to, to knowledge. It's symbolic to, to God. It's symbolic to, symbolic to understanding. So 
this is, so I'm just going to take a second. This is why it's important, right? These are two passages that we've talked about and just one sentence, all three of us could have a conversation for an hour on. So this, there's a lot of information in these tablets, but it's a lot of, it's just in mythos. It's not, it's not saying, right. It's let me just do this. Three is the mystery come to the great one here in light and these will dawn. It's saying that, and that's what I mean by mythos, because in, in a test that in a text that's systematic, it will say what that means. It won't put it like that. It'll say when you, you know, God is in the form of X, Y, and Z, or the creator's in the form of X, Y, and Z. And the light is its emanation from infinity to your vessel. And, and you know what I mean? So having both, being able to look at this and, and and break it down into some form of understanding and not just awe is 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 extremely important. But that's that's just kind of me rambling. Go ahead and what do you think, Jordan? Well, yeah, exactly. Like you said, we could all sit around and even if we have the keys to the mysteries, even if we know the the one and the one is the key to the three we could still debate it eternally and it wouldn't necessarily be it's less of a debate when you have the keys it's more of an elaboration yeah um so when people don't have the keys it's more of a debate because they're like well i think it's this and i think it's that and it's like well no the mysteries and the mythos is very specific there's a very specific reason why there's a one and there's a three. <laughs> and we could break that down from a mathematical standpoint. We could break that down from a geometrical standpoint. We could break that down um, from like a biological standpoint because it relates to reality. There's an unlimited amount of ways that we could break that three down. I mean, even Nikola Tesla spoke on it as a scientist, mm -hmm. the mystery of three and the six and the nine. So, this th this mystery is unlimited, but you know, very specifically, we'd like to hear from you what you think about it and how it relates to Kabbalah. Wow! Um, so this is essential. This is essential, and this will bring us back to us having a part two of our first. <laughs> uh oh! <laughs> it's actually my entryway. This I found my way into it, but um, which is uh, necessary. For example, I mean, okay. From a scientific point of view, if you have matter, all of a sudden you have three things that come into being with matter by itself. You have matter, space, and time. Automatically, they come into existence all together at once. Okay? So, from the one into creation is automatically giving us three things right away. But there's a deeper, there's a deeper aspect to it. Because uh, three is the mystery come from the great one which is the limitless light, okay? The limitless light has, um, what was the word from the tablets that they used? They, um, well, the Kabbalah, they teach it, it's engraved in itself. So it's created a restriction of itself, which all of a sudden now becomes two, okay? That restriction created a tzimtzum, which created a place for creation to come into existence. So now one is two. And the third aspect is the interaction between the two of them. Mm. So automatically there, there's one that has become uh, become three things. And from those three, everything else come, comes after that. There's nothing else. There's no other way that it could happen because there's a one wave, there's a one uh, superposition, how you guys want to, how you want to call it. As soon as it creates a substance out of itself, which is still itself, but it's a coarsening of itself, all of these things just follow suit. This is why we have math. This is why one, two, three, four, five, six comes after whatever you call it. You can call two, 12, you can call five, 16, whatever language that you use, the sequence is always the same. Okay, yeah. So as soon as you have a space, now you have space, time, and matter. So these things have to start manifesting the way that they do. And if it doesn't follow the pattern, which is important to know that there is a pattern and knowing this pattern is what is going to help you apply spirituality correctly um, and um, realizing that that pattern is the key to it, right? Because if it's not following the pattern, guess what? Those worlds are obliterated and they speak about this. The Kabbalah speaks about universes that existed before this one happened and it was a bunch of failed sparks, basically, right? And this is very interesting once you get into it. So there's a process and there's a science to it 
This is why Kabbalah is the science of receiving. It's the science of receiving what? Of receiving this light, which we call it knowledge. You call it God. You call it this. But what is its actual essence? It's something much. I mean, that's why you have to enter it with awe. And that's the only way to it. Because as soon as we start naming it something, you've limited it. And that's the true definition of an idol. An idol based to a Kabbalist is a limitation of Hashem, which means a limitation of God. As soon as you call it a something, you've already limited it to something that is much smaller than its true essence and its nature. So one is three. Sure. Yeah. And I think just to have a little bit of physics in here, I, I like how you, you brought that up in the superposition, right? So what he's saying is if you have, as long as you have space time, you have something there, then you can take that something and create a separation in that something because you didn't create energy. There's nothing was created because up here on the, on the, let's say the top wave, it's a peak and on the bottom wave, it's a valley. So when they come together, they still are nothing, but, but not nothing. It's just, it's two things together. And that's what a superposition is. Right? A wave is made up of other waves. But then you can use that same logic and say, well, nothing is the summation of all waves. And that's right. As long as something's there, you've got one wave, you've got two waves, but now you have something. Now you have, you know, quantum, now you have superposition. Now you have quantum field theory. Now you have matter and it all can't come from the absence of something. Right? You can't be nothing's there. Mm -hmm. Something has to be, there has to be some underlying something because you can't go from nothing to something uh mathematically but but you can go from something to nothing and that's and that's what the kabbalists have taught they taught the sages say this is existence from absence meaning that we have an absence a carved area in this light which is not really a carving but it's actually a coarsening of itself itself has been coarsened just like quantum field theory you guys have mentioned many times what happens with an excitation of the field? You have energy gathering in one place. It pulls to, to one place and then it becomes excited, which is excited by its own nature because it has now compiled itself to something that is separated technically from the entirety of itself. And so it has its own existence in a sense. So it's carved itself out of something. So this is an existence from absence because what has happened is the light has been restricted and now we see ourselves as a separate being in a place where existence can occur of space, time, and matter, right? Which is the three from the one. Yeah, and it's, un it's unique how they could conceptualize something as profound as QFT uh, thousands of years ago, and they came up with the concept of seem soon and, being a, and, and having the densest point of materiality by restricting itself. Um, but once again, that's why philosophical knowledge is necessary, even in a scientific setting, because when you are a scientist and you're thinking about QFT and you're thinking about quantum mechanics, you also know that none of the stuff that you actually perceive is as it is. This is your perception and your vehicle yeah. allows for you to conceive it in a specific way. And then the math allows for you to make it practical. So even Kabbalists will say, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't describe the creator. We describe our perception of the creator. That's right. And then our, our, the degree of our perception is relative to what we've attained, which is why we can name it, but we're not attached to the name. We're just marking out our steps along the path. Yeah, your, your so, vessel, everything is based on your vessel, right? You, you as a creative thing, are not taking the reality as it is. You take it as your vessel can can oblige you to see, right? And, and um, so, no, you do not see the reality as it is. But the more that you develop your vessel correctly, the more that you are able to unfold the, the, the reality around you. Equal to the form, right? Because in spirituality... Uh, to kind of expand a little bit on that term, they, they, they say equivalence of form. Once you equalize with the le level of reality, it becomes unlocked to you. So you're hidden behind gates and gates and gates and gates and gates of this mind that you, that you live in, the mind to create. And so as you expand your vessel, your vessel is able to equalize with those gates. It becomes the key to the lock and you unlock those those. Layers, which is equivalence of form. You equalize with the form of that 
degree of reality and it no longer holds you back. Yeah. And, and that gets back into what we were talking about earlier about the 32. And I was, you know, trying to get you to talk about the 22 letters in the 10 Sephiroth because the 32 is also in relationship to physics. So they talk about how the 32 archetypes, um, how they uh, allow for the fractal pattern of creation to replicate itself multidimensionally speaking and every form that transpires here is a reflection of these archetypes in the higher planes and they use the 22 letters in the 10 sephirot to describe that process yeah it's true there's many ways to break it down that's one of them of course there's 22 letters which are the 22 original archetypes uh and um through this 10 sphere system which is actually 11 spheres one is held and there's a lot to it and then you have a front and back of the tree so if you have 11 on the front 11 on the back well, there's your 22 mm. okay so that front and back just means positive and negative okay so you have a positive face and you have a negative face this reality that we're locked into is the back we can't see the front yet unless you're doing your work and you're able to enter depending on your equivalence with the form of that front. And there's multiple fronts and backs, right? So, so we're at the, we're at the hour form. mark. I appreciate, so, sorry, Vitaly. I just want to make sure we're at the, we're at the hour no, mark. No, I know no, people no. are kicking it. We've got some questions. We're not going to be able to go into, I don't think our, our part two debate, cause I had to get this for Jay smoke, but hopefully you can uh, stay for questions and, and uh, <laughs> we, you'll join us another time. I'm sure. Uh, so if you've got questions, if you're out there and you've got questions about what we've talked about or just questions in general for me, for Jordan, for Vitaly, right now would be the time to answer them. We want to spend you know, the next 20 minutes or whatever going over questions. Uh, so the first one that we got is from Aquavision. Can you provide insight into the symbolism behind Toth's various representations, such as the Ibis-headed man? I think I'm saying that right. Um, I don't know, Jordan or Vitaly. I'm not quite sure. Is that the... I think it's Ibis. Ibis? Oh, yeah, I think it is. Ibis, Ibis, or Ibis, maybe. It's Ibis, it's the Ibis bird. Hmm. Mm. It's Ibis, okay. Do you have any... I mean, I, I haven't, you know, that's it's a great question. Uh, Vitaly, do you have any... Oh, yeah, yes. Ibia. Oh, Ibis, Absolutely. okay. So, so, so Thoth, Thoth... Thoth. His name is Jehuti. His name is yeah. Jehuti, and the, and the day about obviously based on who's ever came to Egypt and took it back home, and who we're reading from. The Greeks usually is uh, where we get our pronunciation of it. But it's also where the word thought comes from. Mm. Thinking, the principle of the mind, and the two major aspects of, of what he was represented by was the ibis bird. And the baboon, right? And so now you have two aspects of the mind. You have the higher mind and you have the lower mind. Mm. Okay. And so obviously he was the god of what? Wisdom, knowledge, right? Science. Yeah. So that's why he would be represented sometimes with the head of a bird because, I mean, flight is symbolic for the initiation or wisdom, understanding. And yeah, and I think it was also something particular that the bird did as well, but I can't remember. But another thing is comparing it to Hakma and comparing it to, you know, him being a scribe. Hold on real quick. Hakma meaning? Meaning wisdom. So Hakma meaning wisdom you know, and he's the God of wisdom, you know, and also the God of writing and so forth, but he's writing down the divine impulse, which comes from Keter or, you know, in, in uh, like the Metuneters, Asar. So the wisdom that Asar had, which he represents the light itself or the state of bestowal, because he's giving, he represents the force of giving. He's giving this light to uh, Tahuti or Toth, and he's writing down these divine insights the same way the right hemisphere writes down uh, the raw data that we were talking about earlier, because bestowal comes from the external force. 
and then it impresses itself upon us. And then that's basically how you awaken a desire in Kabbalah, if I'm not mistaken, right? That's how we awaken our Reshamat. And, and what is writing when they talk about the entire creation was created by words, right? The word was is the beginning, right? In the beginning was the word. The thought of creation. Uh, every, everything is an engraving. So this is, again, we have to take it to the higher, highest aspect. Any spiritual system, no matter where it's coming from, is always written in this in this way. There's multiple layers of understanding it, right? So we can take it at its physical level, but the sages tell us that's for fools. Not to say that it's, I mean, you're you're stupid for, for thinking of it that way. No, but that's just the lowest degree of understanding. And so based on thought to his thought, it, it's the process of the thinking principle. And the thinking principle is the thinking of the mind as it's engraving thoughts into creation. And that's writing at its highest aspect. Mm. Right? Because even the sages of Kabbalah, they taught the black of the letters on the white of the page mm -hmm. represents the writing of the vessel in this field of light. The creations that give it the form, which we can now make sense of this light through it. Right? Yeah, because creation happens in Bina, technically, and then that's right. what gives it its form, which is where those 22 letters and those 10 sephira are archetypes. So it's that's writing so down and engraving that. Yes. Another thing is, so you mentioned the baboon. Does that have anything to do with the letter Kof? The um, monkey. The monkey, yeah. Well, there, there's multiple... Uh, uh, that's the 19th letter. And again, you have to get into the numerology to truly, to really understand it. Because uh, the following letter after that is Resh, which means the head. Right? And so there's, there's multiple le levels to it. And every number has its positive aspect and its negative aspect. By looking at the negative aspect, it's only showing you what needs to be overcome to achieve the positive aspect of it. Right? So that's the dark side, which needs to be, which is revealing the light of itself. So what is the next question? Yeah, we'll see what, so the next one. Okay. Jay Smoke, the tablets speak on astral projection. Can you ask him his take on it, please, dears? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, Vitaly, I think he's, he's at, he want, he would like your take on astral projection. Which we did talk about with the fine structure a little bit, but we did. But go ahead. Bit, yeah, but um, so astral projection is um, the process of escaping your lowest vessel, and we have multiple vessels. If you consider yourself a tree, you have your malkut, and you have six spheres on top of that, and then you have the crown of the three spheres on top. Now, every degree has a, is a is a tree. So, for example, the Earth is a tree. You as a man is a tree. The sun and the solar system is a tree. The galaxy is a tree. The universe in its entirety is a tree. And then you have the primordial tree, which is one tree for the entire system and knowing how, and how to play it. Now, this is the, the pattern, and this is why it's so important to know the pattern, because it's actually teaching you what the purpose of this is. And the purpose is for you to expand out of the lowest vessels in knowledge. And so astral projection is the process of breaking out and exploring and having, you know, uh, if you can do it, if you can do it uh, consciously, this is where you have a completely different world, right? It's a reality. Is it less real than this world is? And who says so? These are actually true realities that, that exist. And they have beings that live there and they have beings on multiple levels of it. So the sages would actually exit out of their body. And this was a test. What they would do in those sarcophagus in the uh, in the pyramids is what they would test you. You'd be locked up for three days, and if you did not know how to do what you're supposed to do, guess what? You you would have to try again next time, which means in your next incarnation because you would be dead. <laughs> right? There's only a certain amount of of oxygen once they close that sarcophagus. If you didn't know how to actually do it and you panicked, that you didn't pass the test. You could not become a priest. Right. And so they were, they were forced to explore and there's schools and there's there's worlds beyond this one. And I mean, the astral projection is, is a tool. And I had a teacher in a spiritual group who, who would always talk that it was wrong, that you're not supposed to. 
and that it's uh, negative and there's evil and all of this stuff. And that's completely wrong because if you have achieved the level where you're able to do it, there's a reason for that. And the reasons for you to explore, again, you're expanding. You have to use the right pillar. If you're based in fear, you're stuck in your, in your left pillar. All what you know is all that you know. And I'm comfortable with that. So again, then it comes back to your desire. How much do you really want to know and how much are you ready for? Because these things will change your world. You know, they'll change your reality and if you're not ready for it. Right? Which you have certain people who have triggered certain situations and those are now, you know, schizophrenics and uh, people who have broken certain things. And I mean, I have, I have an understanding of that because my aunt, my mother's sister, she went through some things and, she, and I never knew it then. Only when I had my awakening that I realized that, wow, she actually entered into a real reality, but she had nobody around her to coach her through it. Mm. Right? So she had a traumatic experience and, uh, and she began experiencing things and she couldn't understand it. And what did the doctors do? They flooded her with narcotics. Mm -hmm. Then she lost her soul. Right? Mm. She could not function anymore in this vessel. So. And will you also have people that primarily focus on that because they think that's what spirituality is. And a lot of it is derived from the inability to deal with the physical and, the, you know, the physical harsh realities. And it's a form of escapism and people Absolutely. will use drugs to induce those states. So I would like to, you know, notify people like, hey, it's you know, it's not all about astral projection or um, exp or having these psychedelic experiences, especially on psychedelics. Like psychedelics are supposed right. to be like um, an assisting agent, a momentary assisting agent. Mm -hmm. And so when they, you know, when we look back and we say, well, historically the, the ancients would use these things and it's like, well, yes, but when the masters were using them specifically, one was to help the initiate to induce the experience before they could do it voluntarily and the next is it was more ritualistic where they would do it under special uh, or auspicious conditions so it's not something that you're supposed to do all the time nor become dependent upon it um, and a lot of people think that that's what modern spirituality is all about is astral projection and then someone might think well okay I have this natural innate ability. You could starve yourself and potentially push yourself out of your body um, or it could be drug induced, but that doesn't mean that you've reached a high level of spirituality either. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of call it just uh, taking a, what is it? Uh, back going backstage. <laughs> if you go backstage at a concert, like you're sneaked back there. You're not supposed to be here. Uh, so, but I always, whenever I would take psychedelics, it was always work. And I agree. It's, just because you're you're an astronaut doesn't mean that <laughs> that you're uh, spiritually inclined. So keep keep that in mind. But I appreciate appreciate that question, uh, Jay Smoke. And it looks like it's pretty quiet in the comment section tonight. So uh, Vitaly, did you have anything else you want to say? Any any shout outs? Any? Uh... Oh, Mike's muted. I'll say shout out to you, gentlemen, for doing God's work and. Um truly at a time where it's most needed and uh so shout out to you for sure appreciate you appreciate you for that and shout out to you for all the help that you you provide um i know you and me you don't talk a whole lot but you and jordan talk a lot and we we appreciate you assisting us and we have to we have to get that we have to get that part two and we do need to get to the meat of that question i hate to bring it up but i i, I do bring it up as a as a means of you know, we want to have you back on the show. We love having you as a guest. We're, we're, we're and uh, again, it's, it's not a debate. We're building here. So we're building pyramids. You got to build a block to and bring a block to continue the building process. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's all done. And it's all done in, in love and, and respect. So 100%. well, thank you for thank you for joining us. We appreciate everybody's questions. And hopefully if you have any more questions about these tablets, hopefully we answer them. If you have any more, you can reach out through social media, you can reach out however, however you'd like to get a hold of us and we'll gladly, gladly answer any questions. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Peace.